All right. Hello, Dr. Nakai. Um, so really great to sit down with you. We're sorry that you're not going to be with us live for the virtual event on the 22nd, but we wanted to make sure as an integral project partner that you had a chance to talk a little bit about your experience working with the YMCA, uh, supporting the development of the We Value Settlement Assessment, and of course, really taking a look at all of that data that we've been able to capture through the settlement assessment itself. And so I'm going to start off with a couple of questions and just say thanks again for all of your contributions going well back before 2018, because I know you've been working with the YMCA um, since before then. So I guess first question is, can you tell us a little bit about how you set up the assessment questions? What was the work that uh, went into the literature review ahead of the question development? Uh, thank you, Kelsey. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm sorry that I'm not with the team uh, during the the forum and presentations. It has been a pleasure working with YMCA team with We Value Partners. So uh, I really will miss them when they are there and hopefully uh, the type of question they can uh, they are going to ask uh, uh, is, uh, is kind of question I know I won't be able to answer. So I'm quite sure you guys will be able to answer the questions. Thank you. So as far as your question, I, I should stress that this all started uh, when we had several meetings with Hugo and Kamal about uh, five years ago, uh, we had various discussions. Uh, in our discussion, we came to the conclusion that we want to collect longitudinal data. And, uh, and in doing so, we want to capture settlements of the newcomers longer uh, than usually is the case uh, because we are not as much interested on immediate and intermediate outcomes, but we are more interested in the long-term outcomes. And we noticed there is a void as far as the newcomers are concerned. And in doing so, we also wanted to pay attention to uh, uh, newcomers' uh, uh, needs, uh, their, uh, their assets, uh, goals, uh, capacities, all those things that we think is important for their settlement and adjustment to Canadian life. Uh, in doing so, we developed a, a, an assessment questionnaire. Uh, this assessment questionnaire was uh, supported uh, by input from various academic literatures. Uh, after we consulted the literatures and discussed several of these issues between ourselves, we came to an idea to develop a questionnaire which is validated by academics and local experts like, like we value team including 23 community partners uh, that they were involved in the, in the development of uh, uh, this project. We were interested in questions related to settlement, education, employment, healthcare, and various other services, as well as their skills, assets, hobbies, and interests. Um, we basically focused, among other things, we focused uh, on the indicators related to employment, education, language, their well-being, uh, their health, their adjustment, settlement. There was a lot of issues that we focused. One of the issues that we also focused a lot more than others was the ex uh, what we call sociocultural integration, which is their uh, uh, basically their knowledge of Canada, their ability, and their awareness of Canadian society and the institutions surrounding them. Uh, this assessment, if you may call it assessment, was aptly referred to as the social determinant of health. Uh, and it included 14 categories, uh, 75, 74 indicators of settlement. Uh, this questionnaire was presented to each client in his or her uh, first language, primarily Arabic, but also included Chinese, English, and French. I say primarily Arabic because most of the refugees were from Syria and Iraq, and therefore that's why uh, Arabic was primary language. But of course, we had uh, clients from China, uh, uh, from uh, other parts of Africa, uh, and they were English-speaking and French-speaking clients as well. Uh, because we were going to interview mostly newcomer refugees, these were people who were mostly powerless, they were uh, unfamiliar with their rights. Uh, as such, we wanted to make sure that we meet the ethical standards. So the basic issues that we needed to ensure was their informed consent and their privacies. Therefore, we applied to University of Windsor Ethic Review uh, Board 
and accord their approval, approval that our methodology meets academic and governmental standards of research. So that was the first step after we developed the questionnaire, we also had to make sure it meet the ethical standard of research. Uh, in this regard, at the beginning of each assessment, clients were informed of their pur the purpose of assessment, their rights, and the recent consent was acquired and registered. At the end of each assessment, uh, they were asked if they consented to a follow-up interview, and then information regarding the follow-up interview was provided to these clients. If they agreed, their names and telephone numbers were registered in a separate file, and then a unique identifier which linked the assessment and follow-up interviews was created. The purpose of this unique identifier was that the informations are kept in a secure uh, password at the YMCA, but for the purpose of analysis, the unique identifier was linked to another identifier where Rizona Kai would have access to the information for analyzing uh, the outcome, the results. At the end of each assessment and interview, clients were asked if they had further questions, their questions were answered, and they were thanked for their participations. Uh, uh, these questions and responses, as I said before, was kept in a password protected file uh, for purpose of referral and asset matching. In addition to that, result, the, the responses that the clients gave to the uh, YMCA staff who were interviewing them, they were coded, they were recorded, they were analyzed through statistical softwares, and then they were interpreted by uh, myself and a uh, team at, your, at the, y, at the y, YMCA in uh, Southwestern Ontario. Uh, it is important to remember each client was interviewed by a primary settlement service provider, and they did amazing work in interviewing these clients. Uh, the baseline assessment started in November 2019, and then it was completed in February 2020. And then three months after that, from the first time of interview of each client, they were interviewed as what we call the follow-up. The follow-ups were all done during the COVID period. I keep that in mind because it may have had some impact on the kind of result we got. Uh, for one thing, only 145 clients at the time of uh, uh, or analysis were interviewed twice at the baseline and uh, at the follow-up. Finally, the data was coded, analyzed, and presented to the stakeholders. I think in total we had four presentation forums, and these four presentation forums focused on sociocultural integration, education and employment, housing and community, and I think the last one was interest and hobbies. You got it. So and, and that's, I guess, the natural next step in this conversation is we were able to hold those four community data forms this year, but my curiosity is really what surprised you when you were analyzing this data. Um, I, you are not new to newcomer data. You are not new to settlement and integration or sociocultural integration. So what about uh, the We Value data surprised you as you're going through it? That's an excellent question. I really had to think about this question before uh, that I knew that you may ask this question about what was surprising. Uh, because often whenever we do research, uh, one of the questions we have to tackle is what is new basically and what was unexpected. And I think your question dealt directly to that uh, issue. Uh, I would say that two issues really pleasantly surprised me. Uh, first of all, the first surprise you might say resulted from significant improvement in a stated adjustment of the client within a short period of time. Uh, as you may recall, we developed measures of uh, assessing clients' adjustment by paying attention to their assets vis-a-vis -vis their weaknesses and how these are located either inside the client or inside the community that they are part of it. And before collecting the data based on the literature, uh, we developed uh, diagnose, diagnostic measures of these clients uh, in terms of their assets. And for each response, we coded them one and zero. If they possess those assets, which include social support, health, motivation, skills, resilience, certain hobbies and interests, achievement, access to basic institutions, coping mechanism, knowledge, ability, and awareness, 
as well as housing and transportation, etc. We coded them one. If they did not possess these, we would call that a weakness. So the first, if they coded one, they had uh, assets and strengths. If they didn't possess these skills and uh, criteria, then we would say that they did not possess those assets and therefore lack of those. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we pay attention to what is belongs to how much of these assets and weaknesses are part of the community and how much of that part of the individual. So therefore, we also coded them what is among these inside the community and what is inside the client. Finally, we averaged uh, them with each set of the, uh, social determinants of health categories and indicators. Now, this is what I'm talking about surprising. Two patterns emerged from uh, the surveys. First, the ratio of clients' asset to weakness was approximately two to one. That is 66% showed that they had assets of, that, that we enumerated a moment ago, and 34% say they didn't have any of those or they had little of those. This means that on average, clients possess more assets than weaknesses. That was an important finding at far, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm saying, seeing these clients who've been in Canada for a short period of time already seems to be doing generally good, generally well. Uh, so, Put it slightly differently, it seems that they had I indicated that they had more asset that people may think that these newcomers would have. This is important because most of these clients were refugees, overwhelming majorities were refugees, and as such, it was a surprising and satisfying findings to me that they show more asset than weaknesses. Uh, it was also interesting to note that clients expressed that their social and community context contributed substantially to their settlement process. This means that they felt that in coming to Canada, they experienced a, uh, what we call a welcoming community. Uh, so that was the first pattern. The second pattern, which also somewhat uh, was interesting, uh, was when these clients were surveyed again, three months after the initial interview. Remember, they're already showing a large amount of assets. Within the three months period, that's a short period of time, especially part of that is during the COVID, clients' perception of adjustment and integration improved significantly. Overall, the improvement was about 10% in overall measure of social determinant of health. Uh, let me give you some examples of more specific improvement. Uh, their desire for learning improved by 27%. Their skills and resources improved by 20%. And uh, some measures of economic stability improved by 23%. Uh, health and healthcare measures increased by 16%. Other improvements were somewhat lower, but still in a positive. They were positive in a sense because social connections and volunteering in Canada increased by 9%. Uh, safety and housing and neighborhood increased by 5%. Now, we should keep in mind, we, this, uh, the follow-up was done during the COVID-19, which means uh, because of the government rules on social distancing, many of the people were not able to connect and even volunteer during this period of time. So 9% improvement in social connection and volunteering was significant during a period that most of people were not to act on their desires to either volunteer or make connection with friends and people outside their groups. So if it wasn't for COVID, I would expect that social connections and volunteering probably would have been higher. Now, one thing to keep in mind, these changes were generally uniform. It didn't matter if they were males and females. It generally didn't matter if they were belongs to different uh, origins. And so we would expect that most of the newcomers studied here and by extrapolation or the newcomers would improve in their early months and perhaps years in Canada substantially. We don't know that for sure, but because we cannot know, because we only have this data set, but generally there is possibility of extrapolation there. We also look at their pattern of what we call sociocultural integration and notice that perception of knowledge about Canada 
awareness about their surrounding and their ability to cope more than doubled if they've been in Canada for 10 years compared to those who have just arrived. In other words, there is a tendency that for longer the per and newcomers are in Canada, the more likely that they would be integrated in Canada. However, we should keep in mind that we don't assume that such improvement is necessarily predictable, linear, or even inevitable. We think that the process of, and the outcome of immigrant integration is much more fluid and dynamic. And as such, the outcome depends on the, their interaction, the interaction with newcomers and the whole society's populations. The data suggests that the, these clients have the desire, motivation, resilience, and interest and in various hobbies to adjust and succeed in Canada. And these traits, traits are important because they are enhanced by a welcoming community, community that's committed to improving their lives in Canada. This brings me to my second surprising finding, if you might say. What impressed me most was the extent to which various social service organizations, the SPOs, and government agencies are committed to the success of these newcomers. First and most, I, I was impressed by the dedicated work that YMCA of Southwestern Ontario put in this project, starting with developing and designing the project to secure funding and recruiting and interviewing clients. They did an amazing job. Of course, it needs to be emphasized that YMCA is part of the V-Value team and include many settlement partners, including Workforce Windsor Essex and various uh, health, housing, religious, and educational organizations. As you know, the V-Value partners is an example of a group of people and organizations that they have facilitated, uh, they help improve newcomer settlements. And one may call that V-Value partner is the best example of a welcoming community. Let me put it differently. What surprised me the most was that the service provider organization and those who work in forefront of addressing newcomers concern know and care more than many of us in the academia. And that was kind of question my prejudgment that we in the ivory tower know more than anybody else. That was not true for sure. Well, I'm glad we could set you on the right path there. Sure did, Kelsey. <laughs> I mean, the team did a great job on that one. So I have been feeling that I don't know much since then. No, I think we've all learned so much throughout this whole process. So I guess to flip the script then, what met your expectations or what was, you know, kind of up to par with what you would expected going into this innovation process? This actually very much relate to the previous, previous comment I made in answering your question. And I should admit it, this, that when I started working with the YMCA team, I was not sure that I was getting, what I was getting into. I was not sure about the rigor of the data collection in an agency that was primarily involved in in-house data collection. Their primary goal was helping newcomers through orientation and referral. Their data was not intended for academic and research purposes. So keep that in mind. That was my prejudgment and my perception of how these organizations works. However, immediately after I started working with Kamal and Hugo, I was impressed with their practical knowledge of the literature related to the settlement of the newcomers and in-house data collection. During the data collection process and interviews, also, I also met with the staff of the YMCA. In my encounter with them and when analyzing the data, I found myself reassessing my prejudgment. The data collection was highly professional and with little error. This increased my confidence in the reliability and validity of the data that collected, that was collected and presented in the four forums uh, during the last uh, couple of months. Similarly, Higos and B Value members' involvement throughout the process, from the early stages of designing, application, consultation, to when the data was collected, analyzed, and reported, all met my expectation. In fact, they met more than my expectation in this regard. Uh, both in the rigor of the data collection process and the commitment of the partners of, for well-being of the newcomers. 
Uh, the YMCA's work and that of degree value as a whole met more than, I would say, uh, not only my expectation, my colleagues, I share some of this information. They're amazed with the quality of the data and through my various uh, meeting with the team and we value partners, I was amazed with the type of question that uh, they answered, the level of knowledge they had. And I would say that if I was to start taking a course, I would start taking a course with all of these service provider organization, people's we value team who are more knowledgeable, at least practically, yeah than myself and many of my colleagues who are basically, we read, we analyze, and we don't know much, to, uh, uh, so to speak, about the needy greedy part of the work done by helping the newcomers. I Ex thank them all. Experts in all of their own domains, I think. It doesn't matter if it's frontline or if we're talking about the project team or you and your team, I think everybody's been an absolute expert and such an asset in, in each of their parts of the project. So I, I couldn't have said it better myself, so I won't even try. In what ways are we excited when we're talking about the future of the WeValue partnership? What ways are you excited to see the partnership grow in the work that we're doing with the community, but also in what ways do you expect the assessment to evolve? That's a loaded question. So that's an important Aren't question. Aren't they all? Great question. <laughs> Thank you, Kelsey. I think longitudinal data collection, that data which is collected from the same people in several points in time, uh, not only address the immediate and intermediate stages of settlement process, but also provide a window to the long-term outcomes for the newcomers' uh, integration. This means that although we have collected data twice in the initial times and the follow-up time, we still need more information related to the long-term trends. So it would be important that we follow up on these clients in at least a year's time, but preferably also in two or four years. I say this because most literature suggests that it takes several years, sometimes eight to 10 years, for newcomers to catch up to those born in Canada. And that initial progress in settlement often is a function of newcomers' enthusiasm in their early days, months, and years in Canada. So what we find out might not necessarily be as outcome that is due to a welcoming community, although I have confidence that is the case, but it also to some extent is because they're coming from countries uh, with some problems and this is they're highly enthusiastic at the, at the early stage. So it is possible that initial enthusiasm can disappear. It will take many years, for example, for their official language skills to mature, their social connections with individuals who are important, uh, uh, and in institutions which are necessary for their well-being to improve, uh, their educational and employment opportunities and outcomes to materialize. You okay? Yeah. This means that a valid and reliable indicator of V values goals can be assessed more accurately through a follow-up of these clients in a more longer term. I'm also excited that data and hopefully its continual development will enable us to compare results across groups and cities nationally. Uh, this will enable us to evaluate the importance of different types of communities, for example, Windsor, Leamington, London, Calgary, and various other cities which, which, who buy in or which buy in in this project. Some of these communities may be more welcoming than others. Uh, and as such, it would be important to compare different communities to understand what works and what doesn't work in terms of welcoming communities. Uh, the attempt to make what value partner partnership has started nationally is an important step, I think, in my mind in that direction. Uh, and, and as such, not only we need longitudinal data, we also need uh, comparative data. And both of these steps, comparing different cities and that collecting data across time would help us significantly. I think that last note really sums it up, that, that difference between comparative and longitudinal and the importance of both. 
And so how do you think as a, I guess as a last question, how are we going to be better prepared or how can we leverage this data better to create a welcoming community? I think you in the really, really early stages of We Value always say we ask newcomers all the time what they're doing to fit into Canadian society. And we don't often ask ourselves what we're doing to set them up for success. That, of course, it sticks <laughs> with you. So, so I guess in that, uh, on that note, what are we doing and what can we do to better leverage this data to create a welcoming community? I hope I can answer this question. This is really, uh, you would say, an, an important question, but is an ex it, it requires extensive uh, answer to it. I'll give you, I will try as best as I can. As you remember, our data collection revealed that a large number of clients presented a positive perception of their social and community context. This, this finding, in and of itself, should make stakeholders gratified that the work they have been doing is fruitful and is appreciated. Moreover, we noted that these clients are highly motivated and relatively educated and skilled, and they have a lot of resources, hobbies, and interests. They came from countries with significant problems, such as internal conflict and wars. They escaped the suffering associated with these problems. And because of those, they hope to start a new and better life for themselves and their children in Canada. This means that they will work hard in any job. They are highly motivated. This is my perception of uh, immigrants in general, but the, this group of newcomers, because of their background and the exper horror, horrendous experience that they had specifically, I think they would be far more hard worker. They are more motivated to succeed than many other groups. And as such, I think they would positively contribute to Canada's economies and enrich its culture. I think our community will benefit from their skills, from their motivations, from their hard work, and from the cultural contributions that they bring into what is known as Canadian culture. What does this suggest? This suggests that by highlighting their struggle, their resilience, and their motivation to the community at large, the Southwestern Ontario community would realize that more, of course, they have realized that before, but they will realize it more that if they welcome the newcomers with open arms and kindness and provide them with opportunities, both themselves and all of these newcomers, refugees or not, would benefit from it. The outcome it also means that the newcomers would not become isolated. They would not become alienated. They will not become marginalized. Because if that happened, if they were alienated, isolated, and marginalized, this would have significant impact on our healthcare. It would cost the healthcare significantly more because people who are isolated, alienated, and marginalized, they would have mental health problem, and even they would have physical health problem. They would experience discrimination because of their not uh, their lack of, uh, uh, because of their marginalization, because of their exclusions and exclusion and that discrimination is a form of social rejection and that has further negative impact on their health. So I think uh, it is important uh, that uh, the community uh, have an open arm. Of course, Canadian community has always been having open arm and they're always been kind to newcomers, but I think it would probably, if we really want to them to do better and we benefit from them, we should work on this regard and we should highlight the contribution that the newcomers bring to Canada. But the other possibility is that if they're isolated, alienated, marginalized, they probably won't like to stay in Canada. And all the investment, whether it's social, political, and economic investment for bringing them here, trying to settle them is wasted. So all in all, I would suggest that an open arm and a welcome community as such would help them and it would help Canadians as well. Now let's give a couple of examples of why Canada would benefit from it, from their contribution. First of all, the Canadian culture would be enriched because they bring a new way of thinking, new values, new beliefs, new norms, uh, to say the least, new uh, cuisines, which I love. They will fill the gap in the, of the labor force shortage that we have. They fill the problem of an aging populations, uh, particularly right now that uh, for tourism, uh, Fertility has dropped significantly in Canada, and many of the baby boomers are going to age. Uh, they, they have reached their retirement age, and they're going to be an old age, and they need younger people to contribute 
to taxations and working and various social services to help these people. So in all in all, uh, they would bring significant benefit to Canadian society and, and they themselves would benefit if they succeed in Canada. To answer your question more specifically, development of a welcoming community resides not in the newcomers, it resides outside both newcomers and the data. So that's why I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to say how the data would lead to a welcoming community because a welcoming community depends on attitudes and beliefs of the Canadians. In my mind, by highlighting the resources and motivation of the newcomers as shown in this data, and the data we presented in four forums, Canadians can realize the best that the newcomers would bring to Canada and they will become more welcoming to them. They, as I said that before, they are welcoming, they're kind, but they become more welcoming knowing that newcomers have significant uh, skills and assets to contribute to Canadian society. Let me make one final note. And I, I should say that I was impressed by a large number of attendees in this forum. This is to me a point, a point to the significant interest that the V-Value Partners partnership uh, work has uh, generated and the welcome, let me use the word welcomingness of this group who represent Canadian service provider organization and perhaps Canada in general. I was impressed with their work, their contribution, their enthusiasm, and hopefully in future, they would continue in this kind of works and people, newcomers would benefit as I have benefited as an old timer. I thank you very much, Kelsey, for thank all your you questions. So Thank you so much, Dr. Nakai. And I know you're, you're gonna be with us kind of virtually with us, but not with us for the actual event. So I, I know that the enthusiasm is gonna to continue to be in the room on the 22nd. So I really, really appreciate not only the time that you've taken to answer the questions, but everything that you've done. And I think we'll continue to do uh, for We Value as we move forward in the project. So thank you so much.